Climbing Towards NLU on Meaning, Form, and Understanding in the Age of Data. I'm going to start with a one-slide overview of our talk, beginning with the observation that human analogous natural language understanding is a grand challenge of AI. And while large neural language models are undoubtedly useful, they are not, in fact, nearly their solutions to this grand challenge, despite how they are being advertised. This is because any system trained only on linguistic form cannot, in principle, learn the meaning of language. We argue that genuine progress in our field, that is, climbing the right hill, and not just the hill on whose slope we currently sit, depends on maintaining clarity around big picture notions, such as meaning and understanding, both in task design and in the reporting of experimental results. In order to have this conversation, we have to pin down what we mean by meaning, and this is difficult because as competent speakers of languages, we easily conflate the form and meaning of languages, and that's because as soon as we're perceiving one, we're also perceiving the other. However, we're not just speakers of languages, we're also language scientists and technologists, and therefore it's critical that we take a closer look. In this paper, we offer some working definitions. Form is the easy one. Form we take to be any observable manifestation of language that could be marks on a page, it could be pixels or bytes in an electronic representation, or it could be movements of the articulators, that is the vocal tract or the hands and face in a signed language uh, or spoken language. The harder one here is meaning. We take meaning to be the relationship between linguistic form and something external to language. And in fact, we have two ways of looking at this. The perhaps most fundamental one is to look at meaning as a relationship between expressions and communicative intents. So therefore, the meaning relation M um, takes us into the pairs of expressions and intents, E and I. Um, we also, though, because human languages are compositional systems and because there is something in common across all possible uses of a given word or expression, have this other relation C, which uh, involves the pairs of expressions and their standing meanings. Given these definitions, we can then talk about understanding. Given an expression E in some context, recovering the communicative intent I, perhaps using the standard meaning S, is understanding. We're having this conversation. We were motivated to write this paper because of the way BERT and its kin have been hyped up and advertised both in the popular media and also within our own academic writing. And I have three examples for you here. What I would like you to focus on the words understands, comprehension, and recall factual knowledge. Now, if these were meant as some sort of technical terms, they should have been defined, but they were not defined. Um, rather, they just seem to be used to allude to the way humans understand or comprehend or recall call factual knowledge, and that's simply not the case of what's going on with these language models. Part of the reason for this confusion um, is that we don't really understand what it is that BERT is doing um, when it is succeeding at various NLP tasks, and this has spawned the wonderful field of Bertology that looks both at what BERT and its kin are learning about language structure and also what kind of information they're using to do so well on these tasks. Our contribution is not further Bertology, but rather a theoretical perspective on why models that are exposed only to form can never learn meaning. One reason you might expect that a model exposed only to form might be learning meaning is you might go and look at babies and say, well, babies somehow learn language just by being exposed to it. But if we look into the language acquisition literature, we find out this is not the case. Rather, babies who are only exposed to language via something impersonal like TV or radio don't learn that language. Instead, what's required is interaction, and in particular, joint attention. Joint attention is where the child and a caregiver are attending to the same thing in their environment, and they are mutually aware of this fact. There's nice experimental evidence that actually digs into this and can show that more successful joint attention leads to better language learning outcomes more quickly. All right? So what this shows in summary is that the meaning is not in the form but rather languages are rich, dense ways of providing cues to communicative intent because they allow us to build up these standing meanings. And once we learn the systems that allow us to figure out standing meanings from some utterance, we can then use the language to figure out communicative intent even if we are not co-situated with our interlocutor. So if babies don't learn language from form alone, maybe a computer could anyway. We're gonna show you that that's not the case by going through two thought experiments. The first one sets aside natural language for the moment and looks at Java, the computer language. For the purposes of this thought experiment, we are allowing ourselves any type of model at all, but for concreteness, let's imagine BERT or GPT-2 or GPT-3. The training data is going to be all of the well-formed Java code on GitHub, every last scrap of it, but only the text of the code. No output, no understanding of what the unit tests mean, just the text. At test time, 
We give the system a single Java program, possibly even one from the training data, and we expect it to give us back the result of executing that program. Now, hopefully your reaction to the thought experiment was to say, wait a minute, that's not fair. Of course it's not fair. What's interesting about it is what makes it unfair. What makes it unfair is that the training data is insufficient for the task, all right? The training data doesn't have what's needed. What's missing is meaning. In the case of Java, that's what the machine is supposed to do given the code. In the case of a natural language, it's the communicative intent of the speaker. So now we turn to our second experiment where we ask, what would happen if we had a more intelligent and motivated language learner who was trying to learn a human language? For the second thought experiment, assume that A and B, both fluent speakers of English, are stranded on two different islands and they can talk to each other, but only through an underwater cable that connects the two islands. O, a deep sea hyper intelligent octopus, figures out a way to listen in on these conversations between A and B and then performs the most sophisticated statistical analysis you could possibly um, imagine. At some point, O gets lonely and he cuts the underwater cable and inserts himself into this conversation. He, now he's talking to A, pretending to be B. And the question is, can O successfully deceive A into thinking that he's actually B and A is having a, having a conversation with a human being? Whether O can do this depends on what O wants to talk about. A and B had a lot of social conversations about the weather. So when A says something like, what a pretty sunset, O can say, okay, cool. You know, in conversations between A and B, I've seen similar things uh, mentioned a lot of times. And sometimes B, B said something like, reminds me of lava lamps. And so that's what I'm going to say now. And, you know, it's quite likely that A accepts this as a meaningful response and doesn't notice a deception. Now let's say that A has invented a coconut catapult and she excitedly tells B O about this. Uh, and she says something like, I made a coconut catapult. Let me tell you how to build one. What are your thoughts on this? And so O now will have trouble coming up with a meaningful response to this in the technical sense of meaningful, because not only is O incapable of building a coconut catapult underwater, O also has no idea what objects in the world words, words like coconut and catapult and rope and nail and so on refer to. So um, in the absence of the ability to actually construct a coconut catapult and then have a communicative intent of his own that he could then try to express in English, O again goes to statistical analysis of the conversations of the, of the forms that were exchanged between A and B. And sometimes in the past, when A said things like, I made, let me tell you, what do you think? B said something like, cool idea, great job. And then if O sends that to A, it's not inconceivable that A will accept this as a meaningful response, but that's only because A invests all the work into projecting meaning into that utterance. It's not because that was actually a meaningful utterance or had no communicative intent. Finally, let's raise the stakes and let's say that A is being pursued by an angry bear. And so A calls for help and says, help, I'm being chased by a bear. All I have is a stick, what do I do? And so in this case, you know, like what is O supposed to do? So, um, you know, like I don't know what O would say in this situation. I can't tell you what GPT-2 says um, in response to stimuli like this. So it says things like the bear is chasing me or you are not going to get away with this or any number of other very entertaining but completely unhelpful uh, responses check the appendix of our paper for, for more examples, you won't regret it. Uh, but it's at this point that there's no way that A could perceive responses like this as meaningful. Um, you know, it's lucky for O that A got eaten by the bear before noticing the deception, but otherwise this is when O would have been uncovered. So let's analyze this a little bit. O did not learn to communi communicate successfully. And the reason for that is that O did not learn meaning. And the reason for that is that O cannot learn meaning because o could, o could only observe the forms. To the extent that A found O's utterances meaningful, and some of them maybe she did, it was not because those were meaningful utterances that actually made sense. It's because A managed to make sense of them by being such an active participant in a dialogue and actually finding meaning where there wasn't any to be found. The broader point that we're trying to make with this paper is to draw attention to the question of, is the field of computational linguistics as a whole 
climbing the right hill. There is no doubt that the field is climbing a hill very rapidly right now. We're making a lot of progress, but this is not the first time in the history of the field that we've made rapid progress. We did that with grammars. We did that with statistical methods. How do we know that this time it's different? And in order to approach this question, we suggest that we should look at progress in a field, in any field of science, from two perspectives, both top-down and bottom-up. And what we mean with that is that top-down views on progress are when you say, you know, we have an end goal and we have not, like all progress that we make need, made, needs to be measured towards that end goal and we're not happy until we get there. So this is the spirit in which somebody like David Lewis in semantics could say things like semantics with no treatment of truth conditions is not semantics. We have not succeeded until we have succeeded completely we always have the question in mind, are we making progress towards our end goal? This is a somewhat pessimistic, let's call it a German perspective on progress and science. And conversely, there's the bottom-up perspective, which says, but we're making so much progress. We're winning so much. There will be more winning. This is all going great. This is a, let's call it, Californian perspective on progress and science. And this is a completely valid and important perspective because this is fun and this make, keeps people motivated. And we are making progress. There's no denying that. But what we argue here is that this view needs to be occasionally counterbalanced by the question of when we make progress, let's double check, are we still approaching our end goal, whatever that may be, maybe human scale, human level, natural language understanding. Whether we are climbing the right hill is a question that we can only really conclusively answer in retrospect. But there are some things we can do now. So, for instance, when a system does well on a natural language understanding task, it is worth asking whether it does this in a way which leads towards that end goal. Another thing that we think is a great use of our time is to create tasks and data sets which ground language in reality or in interaction, because models which are trained on such data sets are not trained on form alone, and so maybe they have a better shot at learning meaning. And then finally, as a community, let's remember that we're scientists and not marketing people. And let's be a little bit careful when we use terms like understanding and meaning and comprehension. Well, that went fast. <laughs> it's an interesting Time thing. Time flies when you're having fun. I got, I got caught a little bit unawares there. Sorry for that, <laughs> for that brief pause. Um, what an amazing presentation. I, I, I feel terrible that ACL made you squeeze all that into 12 minutes and, and you did a- It was hard. Job. Yeah, um, uh, but I'm really glad that you're able to um, uh, join us now. We, we can extend that time out a little bit uh, with some other questions. Uh, so to begin with, I think there's an interesting observation and maybe question from, uh, from Seth Grimes. Um, uh, so Seth actually runs several um, meetups. He runs the DC, Pennsylvania, and New York uh, NLP meetups. Uh, so Seth, fr from the East Coast, um, are you able to, to jump on video or audio and, and ask your question or share your observation? Sure. Well, thanks, Rob. I will do that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to watch this. And I studied uh, uh, philosophy as well as math in college. And I remember the concept of the intentional fallacy, which said that the author's meaning in a literary or an art context is actually uh, irrelevant in the sense of the interpreter, or let's call it the listener or the interlocutor's uh, uh, concept of uh, understanding. Uh, so just because you mean to impart something to me doesn't mean that I'm going to get it or that I care what you're trying to impart. Uh, so there you go. Uh, you, you, let's cross pollinate a bit if you're willing to take that up. Sure, um, I'll start maybe and then Alexander can jump in. Sure, go ahead. Um, so I think this fits in very nicely with our point that humans actively make sense of what they're perceiving when, when they get an input in a language they speak, they attribute meaning to it. And so we have um, A basically making sense of the octopus's um, contributions to the conversation, even though the octopus has zero intent in mind because the octopus doesn't know what they're manipulating. Um, or if you think in terms of BERT or GPT-3 can spit out lots and lots of text, but there's no intent there. And yet we are amused to go read these outputs and make sense of them. And so I think it's actually, um, a similar concept. I think that it's particularly pointed in the case of art um, and literary um, works, as you point out, because that's all about the experience of, of experiencing, you know, what the artist has created, and it might not match the artist's intention. Different to things like um, contracts and legal proceedings and 
maybe also education where we are much more invested in successfully communicating a particular communicative intent. There, there's a conversation we're having right now, right? Yes. So, so I think, you know, uh, Seth, you really cared that we re could, that we were able to reconstruct your communicative, communicative intent um, from your question, like from the form that you, that you sent over Zoom. Um, and I think that uh, Emily it sounded to me like, you know, was relatively successful in doing that and answering uh, based on that, right? So, so maybe, maybe sort of um, the kind of language use that we had in mind when we wrote the paper was this kind of somewhat more kind of like down to earth um, kind of uh, uh, language use where the speaker actually has an intent that they encode in the form that they then uh, uh, send to the, to the listener with the goal of having that understood. Right, and so not as, a, as an artistic experience, let's say. Let me just use one word, which is adjudication. In effect, the octopus in your example uh, is part of an adjudication process or a reconciliation of multiple possible meanings. Maybe I'm bending the octopus a little bit too much, but in any case, right. we He's do squishy. see contexts where we need <laughs> some kind of reconciliation or adjudication in order to decide a meaning or meanings. I don't think the octopus has access to any meanings at all though. So the octopus is not functioning as adjudication. The octopus is just manipulating form and um, with access to enough of it can get lucky and produce things that A is happy with enough of the time. So the meaning is all on A's side. The, a point that, I mean, I haven't really thought this through because I've never really thought much about literary criticism, but you know, it seems to me that maybe like in any communication, there's sort of a, the listener draws on different types of information to come to a to in their reconstruction process of of uh, kind of, of of the communicative intent, let's say, right? And one thing that goes into this process is the the linguistic form that they received, and the other thing that they um, put in is like whatever context or um, you know sort of hypotheses they have about the speaker or their own past experiences with language and the world and such, right? And it's conceivable to me that uh, in different types of language use, the balance between those different factors could be different, right? So, so that in legal contracts, you know, they're specifically written such that your prior experience with the world should be relatively irrelevant, um, right? Whereas maybe art or like poetry, let's say as an extreme, right? Maybe it's like very much at the other end, right? Where you're supposed to be able to project your own sort of, uh, a prior experience with the world or your emotions or whatever into it or something like that, right? And so, so in that sense, I would say that octopus generated language and, and you know, GPT or bird generated language, you know, is, is way to, to, to that side of the spectrum, right? Because there is no intent that the, that the speaker put in himself, right? Everything that, that arrives in the listener's mind in terms of meaning is something that the listener put in basically, right? So, so maybe that's, is that a plausible way of thinking about it, do you think? I, I think this is really interesting. I think this um, actually also uh, answers the, the next question I was going to call on from, from Hank Hakima about the difference between understanding the language and understanding the meaning behind it. They had a great example about quantum physics, um, uh, which would be at one end of the spectrum uh, versus a legal document where you are meant to know everything uh, that's in there. I think uh, building on, on that relationship between, between knowledge and, and language, there's a really good question from Ivan Lee. Um, uh, about integrating uh, knowledge bases. Ivan, uh, are, are you there to ask that question? Sure am. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, thanks Robert for hosting this. For GPT-3, I was always fascinated because it, it creates such a uh, realistic looking language, right? And so, um, and it can even like uh, use mannerisms, it can have people stutter. So can you just use that essentially as a Mad Lib to say, look, this is what the language should look like, but the correct answer um, can, be, can be derived separately from a knowledge graph. Um, so naively, I would just like put this as post-processing on top of the, the language that was generated by one of these models. So you can use a language model in the traditional sense of a language model, where you have a bunch of outputs that came from some generative process that actually started with a communicative intent or maybe um, the, the translation model, a machine translation system, and then use GPT-3 the way language models are traditionally used to choose among those. So if you, have, if you have the sort of, here's the things that represent accurately the meaning we're trying to express, which one of these looks the most like fluent English, then I think that would be safe. 
if instead you said, okay, GPT-3, take these and make something that looks like it, um, you would risk having random other stuff inserted because it's not grounded in anything that they're trying to say, that it's trying to say, I should say. On a, on a less philosophical level, it's really hard to have, um, uh, to, to build uh, neural energy systems that are actually true to the input semantics. Right, so, um, so that's actually one of the really big problems in neural energy, um, as far as I understand, is that it's like, you know, they, they tend to, it's very hard to keep them, you know, focused on what, what you want them to actually say. Um, and so, um, yeah, but, but I mean, obviously, right, I mean, that would be cool, I think, that, that, I mean, this is a thing that we're not talking about in the paper, as soon as you have a knowledge base, you know, all bets are off, we make no statements about this. At a technical level, it seems to be quite diff difficult to, to actually get that done. Yeah, so I, there's a related question here, question here from uh, Corinne um, uh, in, in terms of ways of, of bringing in world knowledge and more grounded data. Um, uh, uh, Corinne, are, are you there to, to ask that question? Are you talking to me? Absolutely. Okay, yeah, I think um, what I was talking about, and hi, Emily. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you again. We used to work together <laughs> many years ago. Many years ago. Um, and I think Uli is even on the call too. Um, yes. So yeah, I, I was just That's trying funny. to remember what you said on your last slide, um, something about how we could put together uh, experiments that are more grounded in, um, in, in, real, uh, in real life, you know, like have tasks and data sets that are grounded in actual meaning. And uh, what would that look like? So that's a, that's a big open-ended question, so thank you for that. Um, but I think that it, the, the contrast is, so a lot of things that we have in NLP right now that are supposed to be testing meaning are created in this um, sort of artificial, let's crowdsource this and get people to pretend they have uh, you know, an information seeking request or they want to make up reading comprehension questions, these kinds of tasks. And I think if we started seeking instead to say, where do we really want a computer involved in communicating with humans, what are the humans trying to do in that communication and building tasks around that, we might end up building something that is more realistic and more um, easier to ground in terms of, okay, well, what's the shared environment? What's the shared knowledge that the computer and the human would have and build from there? Um, probably way more expensive, um, but I think more interesting. I find it really interesting that that human language use changes with uh, with the with the communicative setting, right? Is that when you when you show people like a few pictures and you say you know write some text but like you know describe this picture or what's happening in this picture? So you know I mean they have no skin in the game, right? So I mean this is like they they'll just write whatever. But you know in a real communicative situation where whatever you want to win the argument or you want to convince somebody or like whatever you want to do, right? Um, um, the stakes are much higher and people talk differently. And so, um, so I find that really quite, quite interesting um, from the data set uh, um, production point of view. And of course, it's going to be much more expensive to come up with, with tasks where people actually have a personal, you know, like actual interest. Um, the other thing that I personally find really interesting is interaction-based um, data sets and tasks, right? Where you have a, let's say, in a dialogue system or something like that, right? A person has an actual interest in, you know, whatever, getting advice on their holiday trip to Italy or whatever. Um, and, um, um, and it's not, you know, it's not just please recommend the best restaurant uh, in downtown San Francisco or whatever, um, but, you know, something more complex than that, right, where both people, both sides of the conversation are able to make mistakes and so on, right. Uh, because, like, I think that, that, first of all, an interaction setting would also break all of our arguments, right, so it's crucial for our uh, argument that O doesn't get to explore language use, um, O just gets to listen to language use, and then has to kind of emerge fully formed as a competent speaker of like pretend English, let's say. Um, um, if, if O had a, had a chance to actually try some, some hypotheses about what, like how to successfully and correctly use, use English, like a child maybe does during uh, language acquisition, um, that's a completely different story. Um, and our arguments don't apply to that. And I think personally, that would be really interesting to see, you know, like, um, could we build uh, computational systems that uh, learn meaning by trying it out on a person, a person responds in some way. 
I think that's a great example. I would, I would, I would just counter that. It's actually surprisingly complicated to find a good restaurant in downtown San Francisco. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I but that's not a language issue. That's the that's the world issue. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, so there was a, a great question asked by, by Pooja here. Um, Pooja um, uh, Valadoni, if, if you're there to, to ask it. Uh, I believe it was um, uh, extending a question that, that Nav had, had or, already asked about multimodal information. Uh, so Pooja, if yep. you're there, I'd love to, to hear that question. Yeah, um, I think I was referring to the fact that um, Nav asked something along the lines of, uh, you know, a multimodal uh, uh, you know, trying to run like language modeling in a multimodal fashion. Um, so uh, along those lines, I was wondering if there have been um, constraints defined in terms of what um, just a language model can accomplish. Um, and if not, um, could we try to, um, uh, well, the, this is a two part really. Uh, first part is, have there been any constraints? Second is, if not, um, could we try to maybe extend the modality um, solely on the basis of language using, you know, interaction-based um, agents? Something I think was addressed like really recently, but I was just curious if there have been any experiments on that front. So, so just to clarify, are you asking could a, could a language model that is trained only on language learn to do multimodal tasks that have, for instance, language and pictures in them? Or is that the question? Yeah, not just um, pictures, but I was referring to more like um, speech, for, for instance. Um, a lot of the communication is also, um, um, it, it's, it's said, it's, it's a combination of cues and nonverbal. Uh, modes, right? So um, I was just wondering if um, if there has been any qualitative analysis um, uh, in history, um, which 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 refers to how much um, um, improvement could be done in you know inferring meaning um, when you include cues or uh, speech. Um, or nonverbal cues in terms of you know body language mm -hmm. and things like that. So, Pooja, I loved I loved your example here in the the chat where you talk about uh, an assistant, um, like a smart assistant, um, mm -hmm. and I think that's a good example because that assistant um, is trying to understand. It knows when you're frustrated. It, it knows when you're repeating a command because presumably the the last one wasn't understood or the wrong action was taken. Um, exactly. So it does it does seem like in in that case, if I'm if I'm reading your question correctly. That there, there is the basis to, to construct meaning. Yeah, so one of the things that we talk about is there's a lot of interrelations between the meanings of words that you can learn from their distribution. And so something that is just doing the language modeling task can sort of build a structure that is ready to um, sort of absorb cues to meaning when there's something external that comes in. And some of these possible cues that have to do with interaction, I think are a really, really rich source. They're certainly rich for humans. And Alexander, I know you have work about um, eye gaze as a signal of success mm -hmm. that might be relevant here. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, I really like the link to the, to the smart assistants um, because uh, that's a scenario in which I could absolutely imagine that a system, you know, maybe it's like decent at its task and then it learns like the last you know, 10% or whatever um, through interactions with all users or maybe with just one user or whatever, right? Um, and so um, so I'm sure that nonverbal cues um, could be um, a really useful um, sort of, mm, could be really useful evidence um, um, in this learning process. Um, I don't know very much about speech level sim signals and what people have done with that. Um, but yeah, as Emily said, um, we had a sick dial paper in 2012 or so um, where we looked at, uh, so this was um, natural language gener interactive natural language generation in a 3D virtual environment. Um, and we basically uh, tracked, we used eye tracking to check what the users were looking at on the screen um, to check whether they had understood the referring expressions that they generated correctly, right? So if I say the blue button, but then you look at the red button, then I can detect that you actually misunderstood me, right? So, so you know, I think your intuition um, 
um, is really good that um, this these sort of um, nonverbal or, or paraverbal cues um, can be really sort of frequent and very fine grained um, um, pieces of evidence for detecting whether you've been understood correctly. Yeah, and I feel like uh, the example for assistant was specifically because speech is more aligned mm -hmm. with language, uh, especially in interaction based yeah. systems, like yeah. I mentioned, um, uh, agents, you, there's a, it's a low hanging fruit, I would think, um, to start kind of inferring meaning. Um, I mean, it, otherwise, it's, it's a little more costly in terms of, uh, you know, interfacing video systems and motion systems. But speech is like, right, at least in interaction based agents, speech and language are both together, right? So ASR. So I feel like that's, that's a good uh, step. I was just curious if there are any yeah. solid. Yeah. Interesting thoughts. Um, I'm not aware that people have looked at this. Cool. Thanks. All right, so there was an interesting question from, from Sean here um, related to, to multiple languages. So Sean, S-H-A-W-N, Sean, um, uh, are you there to, to pose that one? Uh, I know um, both our presenters have a, have a lot of expertise across multiple languages. Um, yeah, so, so my, th my question is, um, what if each of the people on the different islands spoke a different language? So Japanese and German, for instance, do they have we some? Try that right now, Emily. Thank you much. Oh no, you know too much German now. Oh shit, that doesn't work. <laughs> Did they have something that the octopus lacks in that scenario? Yes. So if you have two people who are aware that they both have some language and they don't have the same language, and they are working together to establish um, communication. That, I mean, this is what happens in linguistic field work, right? A linguist goes into the field. In most cases, they're working with bilingual speakers where they share, share a language with a person, but there are cases where linguists go do field work from zero. Um, and there are sort of standard ways of doing this. You can also think to the movie Arrival, um, where we had a xenolinguistic example of this. But you basically have two intelligent entities that are uh, knowingly communicating with each other across a lack of a common code. And so they work to establish the common code. And you probably start by exchanging names and going from there. And it is far harder if you don't share a physical environment. So in our right. example, it's going to be harder for them if they're speaking, if they don't have a, a language in common, um, than if they could be on the same and they could point and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I yeah. Think so I'm wondering if, if, if that is essential. Is, is, that, is that, you know, being able to look at a ball or a tree is that the essential missing ingredient? Um, this so is where your Carl Sagan book comes in, I think, Emily, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you remember the book Contact by Carl Sagan? Mm -hmm. um, yep. So there the premise is that the signal comes from an alien civilization and the first thing they have to communicate is there's meaning here that you should look for. And mm. they decide to go with prime numbers um, expressed just as sort of counts of pulses. And that's sort of the first cue. And then there's something else in there, I think, about true and false. And so the premise there is that an alien civilization would likely have built up a similar system of mathematics to you know, other civilizations. And then that becomes the toehold from which you can build out. And that's science fiction, right? It's not a, something that happened in the real life. But I think that the, um, it's a reasonable expectation. It would be a lot of work, but you could get the toehold that way. And then conversely, you have the issue that, that if you believe, if you sympathize with Quine, right, then you have this problem that not even the shared physical context is a, is a foolproof way of establishing, of, of grounding your, your um, language expressions, right? Where you have the Gaba guy problem and you don't know if he means Reddit or whatever, white or fluffy or whatever the other things are that, that you could be understanding, right? And I think that it's crucial, and Emily kind of said this in passing, again, like the interaction, the, the hypothesis testing, I think is really important, right? So, so I think that um, if, you're, uh, if you're an alien civilization, and you're like a thousand light years away and you have to wait 2000 years to get a response from me, um, it's going to be much harder for you to send me useful signals than if you can directly observe, maybe with a sort of cues that, that Puja just mentioned, you know, of you know, checking for understanding. Um, but maybe I'm just not giving you the, 
whatever um, <laughs> stick uh, that, that you were asking me for or something like that, right? And then you, you see that your attempt, that this particular attempt at using linguistic form to, to convey your intent wasn't successful. So maybe you, that was an incorrect hypothesis and you should change it, right? So, so personally, I think that that interaction, again, you know, like, I mean, but it's a little bit of my, of a hot button for me, but uh, um, uh, um, is super useful in establishing a, a, a shared a communicative system. I, I don't think I would go so far as to say that it's indispensable. Um, but I think it's probably really useful, yeah. For the old timers among us, if A and B were speakers of German and Japanese respectively, they would just need the verb mobile system. <laughs> <laughs> that would solve everything, yes, absolutely. <laughs> that was an early speech-to-speech -speech machine translation system that um, involved those two languages plus English. <laughs> All right, we've got, um, we have time for, for one last question. Um, uh, so apologies if I didn't get to yours. I, I tried to choose as a diverse a range of questions as possible. Um, interesting one just came in from, from Nav, if, if you're there to ask it out loud, although slightly disturbing because it, because it seems to be related to locking a child in a room. Sure. Yeah, I can give it a shot. I mean, it's a follow up from my last question around multimodal kind of language modeling. Um, so I just wrote a thought experiment where it's a cruel one, hypothetical one. Um, so let's say if we take a newborn human child um, and lock it permanently in a room. Um, some hand waving is there, assuming it has the brain, it has the brain power of, let's say, Google's GPU, et cetera, et cetera. And then we, <laughs> we have the power to plant an instruction in its brain. Uh, and then we provide the entire YouTube's video dump and instruct its brain to absorb the scenes. And the training objective here is predict the next scene with all the details, language and visual uh, interaction. Um, <laughs> The child is never let out of the room. No one interacts with it. The question is, do we think such a human child could potentially pick up meaning and understanding? Um, no. I, I, so, I, I, Nev, I really hope you work at an institution that has IRB. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, hypothetical one. Yeah, absolutely. So if we're talking about actual <laughs> humans, no, because we know that, that humans need um, you know, love and, and contact and stuff like that to actually thrive. And so yeah, let's abstract over would, that. Yeah, yes. This human child would not thrive. This seems to be a question about, um, not really about language, but about intelligence and how learning works. Um, and I feel like that's sort of outside my area of expertise. Um, but I think that the, maybe what you're trying to get at here is what are, what are the necessary inputs for human-like learning both of language and of concepts. Um, and part of what I think is going on in that is uh, what are the, what are the, the hypothesis that there might be different possible ways of getting to that. There's, there is um, at least one way that humans do it. I think psychologists would expect it to be relatively universal across cultures. I don't trust psychologists to have thoroughly tested that hypothesis um, because they're worse than um, NLP people almost in focusing on subsets of the population. But let's say there's one or more ways that humans do this on a regular basis. Um, but could you get to human-like intelligence in terms of uh, learning and your, your hypothesis testing strategy or whatever, how you handle inputs um, without doing it the way humans do? is a deep philosophical question about the nature of intelligence that I'm not prepared to engage with, but I'm glad you're asking it. <laughs> <laughs> to the degree that it is within our area of expertise, um, which is language, um, we talk about it a little bit in the paper, right? Um, and uh, we, we do cite literature where, you will, where children will not learn a language by just watching TV and that other language, right? And so, so, um, so I guess that, I mean, YouTube is, probably much more um, data than any child uh, ever watches on TV. Um, but as far as we know, the, the evidence from language acquisition um, says that uh, uh, this hypothetical child Nav, would not learn um, uh, language or would not learn meaning. Uh, I mean, uh, I think the point which I'm going towards is, is it the and based on the definitions you provided for, for let's say the communicative intent and, and see uh, in your paper, that is it the grounding of concepts outside of language? Like we need almost need a second mode, which is key, or there's more to it. Because if, if, it, if just grounding those concepts in another mode, then the language, uh, then the form providing language 
or mode one itself, that could be achieved by a multimodal system where uh, uh, yeah. uh, a good enough brain looking at, at, at interactions where more than one modes are involved could potentially pick up uh, like stuff like joint attention you mentioned. And that could be picked up from the videos itself, like where the humans are looking uh, and maybe some part of interaction even. Yeah, this part is, is, is a big hypothesis, right? So, so I think that uh, to the point of interaction, I think it's important that the language learner itself uh, can perform the interaction and test their hypotheses and not just watch other people interact. Um, I'm not sure that I, um, uh, but, but let's, um, there was something that I forgot now, sorry, but um, we do talk in the paper about uh, learning from multimodal data, right? And so, so I do think that it's conceivable that you could, like, I mean, not conceivable, I mean, it has been done, right? That people have, have, learned, have trained distributional models on language together with photos or a language together with like lots of other modalities, audio and, and there, Stephen Clark even had a database of smells or something like that. Um, and, um, it's conceivable that then for this particular type of grounding, um, uh, the learner could learn that, right? So, so, I mean, clearly, you know, you can have sort of like image classification systems um, and you train it on a corpus that has images together with uh, captions. Um, and then it's going to be able to semantically, relatively accurately uh, label unseen images, right? So, so clearly, you know, there's some sort of grounding that's happening, but it's, a, it's grounding for a very specific facet of meaning, right? It's only that kind of meaning that can be grounded in photos, right? So as soon as then, you know, the system is supposed to do something else with that, like, you know, help you with the angry bear, or, you know, detect whether there are cute puppies in this picture. I mean, it'll detect that there are dogs in the picture, but it won't tell you, like in the paper, we have this example that uh, didn't make it into the talk, um, where you're trained on, on image caption data, um, and then you're supposed, the, we give you a new picture and you're supposed to say, you know, how many cute puppies are in this picture or something like that, right? And, you know, you can't do that because this is not the kind of data you were trained on, right? And so, um, so, 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 so grounding in multimodal training sets will potentially give you access to certain facets of meaning, but there are many other facets of meaning that it won't give you access to. Um, and there's in the paper we cite a, a paper by Bisk et al that actually talks about this in a lot of detail, um, where they actually go through like different levels of types of grounding and discuss what kinds of, what, you know, aspects of meaning could be learned from, from each type of hypothetical data set. All right. Uh, so we, I think we can, we can wrap it up. We've, uh, we've had a Q&A session go three times longer than the, um, than the presentation itself. Um, uh, so I'd like to, to thank Emily and, and Alexander very much for, for joining today. Thank you for having us. This was a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. This was fun. All right. And then thank you all who participated and, and asked questions. Again, my, my apologies if I wasn't able to get to, to your specific question. Uh, please check out the, the Meetup page. If we, if we do share this video, we'll, we'll put it there. Uh, you can find links uh, to their paper there, uh, to an audio version of their paper. Um, we might also add a link uh, to where you two can buy octopus earrings, because I've seen a, a few people comment um, on those. <laughs> um, uh, so th thanks again, uh, everyone who's joined today. Uh, thank you especially to our speakers, uh, to Emily and Alexander. Oh, I, I want to say one more thing. Yeah. Sorry, uh, Robert, because, because you, you said like twice, you said something like uh, this paper is going to give you a more realistic view of what you can or cannot do with BERT, right? Sure. And so, so, so of course, you know, yes, we make this argument that there are certain things that BERT will not learn, um, namely like all of meaning, but this is not meant to kind of sort of undermine the, the usefulness of BERT and GP2, GPT-2 or 3 or 4 or whatever uh, uh, for real, real world applications, right? And we do think that they're super useful, but we do, we, like the, 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 the broader point that we're trying to make is that, you know, it's completely fine if you're an engineer to use those tools and, you know, use the hell out of them and build really cool things with them, right? But yeah. from a sort of scientific perspective, it's a really good idea, you know, to, to, some, to sometimes ask yourself, what is the end goal that we're trying to pursue here? Um, you know, are we aiming for like full 
perfect human level natural language understanding and is this the right kind of tool that will get us there right because we've been burned in the past as a community and you know i think it's a really good idea to ask you know <laughs> what reason do we have to believe that this is now this time is going to be different right so nothing that we say in this paper or have said in this q and a should keep anybody from using bert for tasks including ones that are very meaning heavy let's say right because clearly clearly I, i've seen that in my own research they're super useful for that right so yeah I appreciate that clarification point. Yes, I've definitely seen this paper being mis, um, uh, mis um, uh, categorized as a paper that is anti um, language modeling, and that's certainly not the case if you, if you if you read the paper. Um, and and I share the the same feelings. I, I yes, I this does not feel like necessarily a road to annual um, uh, to general intelligence, general uh, artificial intelligence. Um, but at the same time, I, I love these models. Actually, I use Bert to select the middle name for my child who was born last year. So I, I think, um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, um, maybe I should try that too. Yeah. 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 So you can yeah. absolutely, um, think these are amazing <laughs> tools, but not necessarily, um, uh, accept some of the, um, some of the hype around them. All right. Uh, so yeah, th thank you again for, for, thanks for that clarification and, and thank you again for, for joining. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.